welcome to Science in Pajamas! Woo! Alright, so, since I don't know when we're going to be going back, I thought I'd start making some review videos to help you guys out. And since, you know, we're kind of self-quarantined and all that, why be fancy? Pajamas. Because if you're comfy, you're happy. I firmly believe that. Now, to remind us of some of the material, we're going to start by talking about what is DNA structure. Now, DNA is our genetic molecule. Sorry, I got a little fluffy guy here. So DNA is our genetic molecule. That means it passes on hereditary information from one generation to the next. Let's talk a little bit about DNA. The structure of DNA, don't start barking, the structure of DNA is a double helix. Hey, no, no. Want to say hi for the camera? Come on. Thank you. So we have double helix means two strands twisted together. So, whee, whee. And then they connect in the middle. So that is our DNA molecule. Now it's really, 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 really super duper long. But let's talk a little bit about how it's made up. You notice that it kind of looks like a twisted ladder. So if we were to take DNA and straighten it out, it would kind of look like this. Now again, it still kind of looks like one thing, but if we were to separate it, Now you can see how there are two strands. So we have these two strands. They connect in the middle via hydrogen bonds. They make up this structure. Now we have our double strands. And then they twist up, making the double helix. Now let's talk a little bit about the base structure. Kind of see how it looks like this. Now obviously with lines and whatnot, not as clear. We have these things called base pairs. Or the base pairs are in the middle, but they're part of a larger structure. So what we have are monomers. Remember, nucleic acids, including DNA, they are these long macromolecules. And macromolecules, or polymers, are made up of smaller subunits called monomers. Put a whole bunch of monomers together, bind them up, you now have a polymer. So... The monomers of a nucleic acid are called nucleotides, and that's what each one of these represents. Those are nucleic, or sorry, nucleotides. So, let's talk, oops, sorry about that. Let's talk a little bit more about the nucleic acids, uh, or the nucleotides. Wow, I think this break is finally starting to get to me. All right, so nucleotides are composed of three parts. You have the sugar, the phosphate, and the nitrogenous base. Now before we really get on with the base, because that's going to take the most amount of time, let's talk about the sugar phosphates. They are located on the outside of the DNA. We call the two outer parts sugar phosphates backbones because what happens is you have alternating, let's say that is the DNA, here are the bases in the middle. What you have are alternating sugar phosphates. The sugars connect up with the bases. So S is for sugar. And then you have phosphates connecting up the sugars. So that we have alternating sugar and phosphates. I know it's kind of hard to see because, you know, little writing, big screen, but you get the idea. I'll do a, a blown up version of it later. 
So those are on the outer ends. The question is, what about these inside ends? And that's where the bases are. So since we have two strands and they're paired in the middle, we see this thing called base pairs. Now bases, very cool little things, there's four of them in DNA. Adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Now, we can split those four up into two groups based on their overall structure. We have purines, which include adenine and guanine. And then we have the pyrimidines. Admit it, you guys miss my bad handwriting, especially when you can see that start to slope. So, anyways, pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine. And the main difference between these two groups are like we said, their overall structure. Purines have a larger double ring structure. So they actually are made up of two rings, a hexagonal ring and a pentagonal ring. So pew, 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 pew. Whereas thymine and cytosine are made up of a single ring structure. So just the hexagonal ring. Pew, 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 pew. So what we notice now is we have two bases with big structures and two bases with small structures. Now this comes or brings us to Chargaff and his rule. See, you make up some, or I shouldn't say make up, you come up and discover some pretty cool things in science, some really important things. You get a rule named after you. Pretty sweet deal. So Chargaff's rule specifically states that the amount of purines equals the amount of pyrimidines, which means that a purine binds with a pyrimidine, which kind of sort of makes sense because when you think about it, I need a better eraser. If we were to have two purines and two pyrimidines come together, you'd have two large structures, followed by two small structures, maybe another two small structures, another two big. So the big ones represent the purines and the small ones represent the pyrimidines. Now, if we were to do that, the sugar phosphate backbone would experience an incredible amount of stress because it has to change its shape. It has to actually stretch its bonds and we can't have that. It would be too stressful on the bonds and it would actually likely result in the DNA falling apart, which is bad. So instead, what happens is if you have one purine with one pyrimidine, that means you always have a big and a small base together. How they line up big first, small first, small first, big first, doesn't matter. When you, that happens, you'll now notice that there is not as much stress on the sugar phosphate backbones because it's nice and smooth and even. So that really does help out. So that's why we tend to see a purine and a pyrimidine. Next question should be, well, Miss Komar, why does adenine have to bond with thymine? Why can't it bond with cytosine? Very simply, bonds hydrogen bonds to be specific, and exactly the number of hydrogen bonds. Purines can form, or I should say bases, can form a different number of bonds. This purine, adenine, can only form two, two hydrogen bonds. Now cytosine doesn't want to form two. It wants to form three. Come on, again, you guys miss me, and I miss you too, so that's neither here nor there. So, adenine wants to form two, cytosine wants to form three, it's not going to work out. However, thymine can also only form two bonds. So, adenine can form two hydrogen bonds with thymine, making it a base pair made in heaven. And guanine can form 
three hydrogen bonds with cytosine. We got another base pair made in heaven. Isn't nature awesome? All right, so that's why we always see adenine bonded with thymine and guanine bonded with cytosine. Now let's talk a little bit more about the overall structure. Now we talked you know, about the portions and the bases and all that fun stuff. It's going cool, really, really, really need a better eraser. I promise for my next video, I will have a better eraser. All right. Next, we said that overall, a DNA molecule is made up of monomers called nucleotides. So the nucleotide includes of a sugar, the base, and a phosphate group. Thank you. So a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. Now, that's just one nucleotide, but you put a whole bunch of them together. And by whole bunch in this example, we're just going to say three because, well, I'm the one drawing it. So now we have three nucleotides. How this works is the phosphate from one is actually going to bond to the sugar of the next. So that's how we get our sugar phosphate backbone. You know some of you are going to say, that means Colmar. I thought it was double stranded. And you are correct. Good job. So that means that we have this strand and we have to put the other strand opposite it. Now remember what we said about this strand is the bases are paired in the middle. So we have our hydrogen bonds. Since we have nondescript bases, I'm just going to leave them as just one line to signify the bonds. Depending on which bases though, like we said, we have different bonds. And then we'll have our bases from the other strand hydrogen bonded in the middle with the bases from this first strand. Now, we have to have the sugar. Keep in mind, we had phosphate top, sugar base. But if we were to do that here, if we were to have the phosphate up here, it actually wouldn't work. What it has to do is, if you're wondering, but Miss Komar, why is that? Let me show you. First, let me draw it, and then I will show you why. We have, and yes, Miss Komar is writing the letters upside down for a reason. You'll see why in a moment. Do, 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 do. All right. Oh, yeah. Pwah, pwah. So now, just like over here, the sugars and phosphates of two different nucleotides have to bond up. So we have that to there. Now the reason why, if you notice, I drew one of the strands upside down. Because this is a nucleotide, phosphate, sugar, base. But if we want the bases to actually meet in the middle, then that means one strand has to be upside down. You ready for some magic? Check this out. Bum, 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 bum. Now this side is right side up, and that side is upside down. So what that means is, bear with me. So what that means is that one strand is actually always gonna be upside down from the other. They run in opposite directions. We'll get into why that's important later when we talk about replication. Not in this video today though, so don't stress. What we call this is anti-parallel. And all that means is that, yes, the two strands are parallel, but since they're running in opposite directions, we call it anti-parallel because they're not running in the same direction. One of them is upside down from the other. So you have a whole bunch of this, and that's how you get your fabulous DNA. 
Now I know we already talked about it, but I didn't actually use the correct term, so I'm just going to throw that in right now. Complimentary. I don't mean give Miss Comar compliments because she's silly and awesome and doing this in her PJs. Although if you want to, I'd be more than happy to. Um, but bear in mind, I did disengage comments on my videos, so any comments will have to be done in our Google Classroom. Now, complimentary simply means that we can use one strand of DNA to figure out the other. And that boils down to what we were talking about already with Chargas rule. Ms. Colmar will get this right, I promise. All right, so Chargas rule, we already said, A bounds with T, G bounds with C. So that means if I have a DNA sequence that reads G, C, T, T, A, G, A, T, if that is on one strand of the DNA, I should be able to figure out what the other strand would be based on Chargaff's rule. So all we have to think about is what did Chargaff told, tell us? What was his rule? Well, his rule was that purines have to bond with pyrimidines and specifically adenine has to bond with thymine because they can only form two hydrogen bonds and cytosine has to bond with guanine because they can form three hydrogen bonds. So that means Anywhere I see a G, I know there should be a C base paired with it. So C would be here. C and G go together. So if I see C, that means G. I see T, we know A is its buddy. So A, A, adenine, that means thymine. T, C, T, A. So anywhere you see a G, C is its buddy. Anywhere you see A, T is its buddy. And that's all that complementary means. So hopefully this was informative, a good review. We'll do some more videos like this throughout the week where we talk about DNA replication, some of the history on who discovered what about DNA. And until next time, just know that I hope you're all doing well. I do miss my kids. And just stay safe. And be awesome, because I know you guys are. Don't get to your work also. It's posted up in our Google Classroom. Has been since last week. So, until next time, hopefully we'll be back to school before we all know it. And just stay safe and know that Miss Comar misses you all. And I will speak at you at the next video. All right. Bye-bye.